Hello and welcome to an Ambersat assembly video. Today we wanted to go over the easy steps that are involved in assembling an Ambersat 1. So using this Ambersat kit, let's demonstrate. Find out more about our kits at ambersat.com. Let's take a quick look at the tools needed. A soldering iron or station is required. A multimeter is recommended for fault finding. A pair of cutters, the finer the better. Treasers or treasing. A craft knife is usually handy. And some extra toys and gizmos for the soldering. Before we get started, let's fly through some health and safety do's and don'ts. Do be sure to keep in mind that your soldering iron is hot. Don't be using it to keep your tea warm, however. Do make sure your workspace is well ventilated, either with extraction fans or at least be sure to have a window open for airflow. Don't hotbox yourself in a confined workspace with no airflow. And finally, do be aware of your cable management. It's far too easy to accidentally melt through any power cables. Don't leave your iron place on the work surface. Cage it and power off when not in use. With that out of the way, let's prep our workstations. Wet your sponges or get your head cleaner to hand. Warm up your soldering iron. Depending on the solder you're using, you may need a higher heat than seen here. But before we start, here's a little trade secret. Blutac, our unofficial sponsor that didn't actually sponsor this video. Blutac is the perfect helper when it comes to soldering. Take note in the coming exercises how it's used to make life just that little bit easier. So the first step is mounting the antenna so that the Ambersat's transceiver doesn't burn itself out when it tries to send a signal. Your antenna should be about 9 centimeters long, 91.5 millimeters to be exact. This is to best match the resonant frequency for the 915 megahertz frequency that we will be using. The antenna will mount here, either partially in or laid across this golden colored circle. Though be sure not to bridge any of these points here. These contacts are meant for the optional addition of a coax union. A short circuit here is bad news. I will show you a handy multimeter check later to test for any accidental shots. But for now, on to the how-to. Use a knife, snips, or whatever you have to hand to remove a little bit of the insulation from the antenna. You can use wire strippers if you wish, but you really don't need to remove much. Now that we have a little bit of copper exposed, we can attach the antenna to the main board. But a little bit of friendly advice, this is where you want to start using your blue tack. Notice how I have stuck down the PCB onto my workstation with a bit of blue tack. I'm also going to use a sneaky sausage made out of the stuff just to help keep the antenna in place while soldering. Take your time and make sure everything's lined up nicely. No need to rush. Once aligned, it's a simple matter of heating the exposed copper and the area below with the iron, feeding in just a little solder, just enough, and done. Be sure to give your antenna a quick tilt just to make sure it's firmly attached. Keep your tips clean and let's move on to a continuity test. So what is a continuity test? A continuity test is where we send a small current from our multimeter's battery through a chosen pathway. This is particularly useful for detecting whether or not we are connected to things we aren't supposed to be. So in case you didn't already know, allow me to show you how to set up a multimeter to detect ohms. Ohms being the unit of measurement for electronic resistance. When setting up your multimeter to detect ohms, you want to make sure your black cable is in the COM or ground port. Make sure the red cable is in input, as seen in the image here. To set up for reading ohms, you want to turn your dial or select the groovy looking horseshoe symbol, which is the symbol for ohms. Now, if you're lucky or you've got a really good multimeter, your multimeter will also have a beep setting. I have to press select in order to access my beep setting, but it makes life just that little bit easier so that you don't have to look at the screen constantly to see if you've got a open loop or a reading. 
Once set up, you will notice your display saying or L. This stands for open loop and that we're good to go for testing for ohms. As we already know, this is your antenna. It's connected to your transceiver, which will send a signal out from this point here. As mentioned before, we don't want to bridge anything in this area here. This top pad is grounded, so a good way of checking is to find any ground pad. I'm going to use this one down here just to keep the PCB stable. Just tap your soldered point with your other probe. The meter should not beep and should display or L. This shows us that the antenna is not grounded. Where we do want to beep, however, is between this top left point on the transceiver and the antenna itself, because that's where the signal will be running. Like before, place the probes on both points and we get a reading. This is good news telling us that our antenna is connected to the transceiver correctly. The last check that you want to perform is to test the continuity between the antenna solder point and these three points here. Though we have tested the ground already for the sake of sanity, it is worth checking. We don't want a connection here. If you get a beep, run some copper wick over the area. With that testing out of the way, let's move on to the next step of assembly, which will be the programming pins. Let's just roll out a high-tech sausage first to help align the programming pins with the contacts. To help keep things neat and tidy, I'm going to start with the ground connection. The ground connection, if you didn't know, is labeled GND. And rather than do a full solder, I'm just going to tack this on to start with, just to allow it a little bit of flexibility while I align the pins and solder the data terminal ready, which is labeled DTR. Don't worry about not knowing what the acronyms stand for on the contacts. We will cover that in the next video. For now, just focus on aligning your pins and getting them attached securely. Now with the pins in place, you want to use your iron to heat the contact and the pin itself. Then feed solder onto the heated area. Take care not to add too much solder as this will trickle through the port and potentially ruin the flushness of the rear of this PCB. Try and keep it flush just so it is easier to mount the solar panel. Once you are happy with your solders, make sure to solder correctly the ground and the data terminal ready which you tacked in place just to ensure a decent connection. Be sure at this point to check the rear of the PCB just to make sure there isn't any bulging or any short circuits caused by excessive solder. If there is any bulges or any excessive solder, just run your iron over the area like seen here. Once nice and flush, that's it, programming pins on. The next step in assembly will be to mount the daughter board sensor to the Ambersat 1 main board. Here it is particularly essential to have a flush solder on the rear of the PCB. If you're not completely confident with how to get a flush solder, I recommend watching our previous video on the basics of soldering. So get hold of your chosen sensor. Uh, I like to use a little bit of double sided tape or M3 tape on the rear of the daughter board just to help keep things in place while soldering. Just be sure to line up the holes of your daughter board with the holes on the I2C interface found at the top of your Ambersat 1 mainboard. Once aligned, we're going to need another high tech sausage. Make sure it's a thick boy this time and place over the top of the daughter board covering the contacts like seen here. Take care not to compress the blue tack too much at this stage. Once aligned, just turn the PCB over, exposing the rear, which is where we want to do our flush soldering. From the bag of components, take the extra pins or resistor wire which has been provided and place it into the blue tack as you see here. Take note, it is these four points that need to be soldered, but for the sake of demonstration, I'm also soldering D3. With your resistor wire or pins in place, take your snips and cut them as close to the board as possible. Utilizing your tweezers, 
tap the protruding metal to embed it further into the blue tack, which will help allow you to get a flush solder. Taking care not to use too much solder, heat the contact pad with your iron. Hold for a moment before introducing a small amount of solder. Then glide the iron away rather than lift to help form a flush solder like you see here. If you're new to soldering and you're struggling with this stage, you may want to take note of the angle I have my iron at, using it more horizontal to give it more surface contact with the pad, heating the entire area quicker. And don't worry about not having perfect solders or adding too little, you can tidy these solders up later. Take your time and get comfortable with what you're doing. We can uh, worry about tidying up any solders once the top side of the sensor has been soldered. Though OCD demands that I tidy this one up right now. With your back side of your PCB soldered, turn your board over and remove the blue tack and any lingering residue. Then cut back the pins just roughly this time because the flush solder is not needed on the top. Just roughly will do. For the top side of the center, we're going to go for a classic conical solder. So with your iron, heat the contact pad, the protruding metal, and then hold for a moment before introducing a bit of solder. Hold the iron there for a moment, then lift. Excessive solder at this stage may cause your flush soldering to bulge. So be sure to check each and every solder you have done previously at the rear of the PCB. Checking the solders on the back of this, it looks like there's no problem. Um, Tom's as if I know what I'm doing. At this stage, if any tidy up is needed, just run your iron over it. Hold it there for a second, just let everything reflow and settle into place. For more extreme cases of bulging, you may need to use a bit of copper wick or a sucker gizmo to tidy up the affected area. And that's that for this video, since it's turned into quite a long one. In the next video, we will cover some testing and some programming of the Ambisat 1 board itself. How did we do today? How would you have done today? Let us know what you would have done differently down in the comments section below. As always, thank you for watching and find out more about Ambisat and our kits at ambisat.com.